Hello and welcome to this week's live cast. I am Jamie. I uh, work for a company called Stillmeyer Games, as you probably know if you're watching this on Facebook right now. And I am happy to be here as I am every week at Wednesday, on Wednesday at 10 a.m. Uh, St. Louis time, to discuss some random topics, to share some Stillmeyer Games news, what we're working on here at Stillmeyer Games, and um, and to answer your questions. If you have any questions about uh, still my games about me about our games and any, anything you want to discuss I'm here for the next hour to talk about it um, I see some friendly faces joining us right now Tony Jennifer miles. Thank you for dropping in today Michael is here, too um, And you can see my cat Walter was briefly in the background there now. He's gonna wander off and take a bath oh, Looks like Carlos has a long comment right off the right off the bat. Let's see Carlos says that he bought Tapestry, which joined Scythe, Wingspan, and Viticulture as the Stillmeyer games he owns. Thank you for, for trying out Tapestry, Carlos, and the rest of those games as well. Um, he says, since my limited budget will be used mainly for Stillmeyer games in the future, I'm honored by that, uh, although there are lots of great games from a variety of other publishers. I hope you don't truly limit it just to Stillmeyer games, but I'm honored that you, that you choose to support our games. Uh, Carlos says, I'm dying to learn more about your Zelda-inspired game when it's time. Um, and just to clarify that a little bit, it's specifically Breath of the Wild that has inspired a cooperative exploration open world game that I'm working on. It's not the Zelda um, IP or the Zelda, the Zelda franchise or even Zelda itself um, that has inspired it. I just want to make that clear because I know people love Zelda, love that mythos, and it's not that. It's uh, Breath of the Wild specifically that has inspired this game that I'm working on. Um, and he says, I want to ask you what... Uh, what to do, what do you want to accomplish with your next Wingspan expansion and your first Tapestry expansion? Um, yeah, so for the, the next Wingspan expansion, it is the Oceana expansion, which is based on like Australia, New Zealand, that area of the world. And uh, that, that, it's something that Elizabeth designs, of course. Elizabeth is the designer for Wingspan. And um, we'll talk about it a, a lot more later in the year. Let me see if there's something I can share now. I, I can share that we have added a new ability um, to the game, a new, uh, a new ability that you'll find on the bird cards that I think you'll find exciting. Um, that's the, and there's actually a bunch of other cool stuff that Elizabeth did. She does not hold back with these expansions. I, I love her approach to them. And so that's all I'll, I'll hint at it for now. As for the first Tapestry expansion, um, I think the one thing that I've said about it so far is that it is largely a more stuff expansion. Um, but I will say one thing that we did with this expansion um, that uh, I think maybe the one major gripe about Tapestry is the balance, um, that some civilizations are more powerful than others or, or easier to win with than others, I think is the best way to say it, and some are more difficult to win with. Um, these are issues that we had hoped to iron out with all the playtesting we did for Tapestry, but, and I think the playtesting was enough, but it was more the data analysis was lacking a little bit. And so we now have a data analyst, a guy named Jeremy, who is really good at going, doing a deep dive into the data. And he did that for, um, for the Tapestry expansion, the first expansion. So I think people will find that it's um, more balanced, hopefully a lot more balanced than the original game. And with all the adjustments that we've made with Jeremy's help to the original Tapestry expansions, uh, Tapestry civilizations, those are, are more balanced as well, I think, at this point. So I'm, I'm excited to see what people think about the balance of the, the, the new Tapestry expansion. That'll be later this year as well. Uh, Josh is dropping by for the first time. He says he's been playing a lot of tiny epic games and he really enjoys them. That's great. I think there's one on Kickstarter right now. Um, and I have some, I'll talk about some games that I've been playing lately and some Kickstarter topics in a moment. Steven says, what do I follow most? The Blues, the Cardinals, or Mizzou? Uh, these are some St. Louis area teams. Mizzou is the, uh, University of Missouri. I would say the Cardinals I follow the most, um, in St. Louis, among St. Louis teams, although my the main way that I follow baseball is through fantasy baseball, which unfortunately hasn't hasn't happened this year. Julius says that his kids are loving the My Little Scythe expansion. That's great to hear. Uh, Melissa from the, the Dice Tower is joining us. Melissa has the great um, show on the Dice Tower network called Teach the Teach. So she teaches you how to teach games, which I think is an excellent addition um, to the the universe of of media in world and in board games that her, her, her talent are, is teaching people how to teach games. I think that's awesome. Um, so if you're the teacher in your group, you might, you might find Melissa's advice to be useful. Zach says, have I played any of the Dale of Merchants games? If so, what are your thoughts? 
Actually, it was a pleasure. Um, a few weeks ago, I, I got an email from, I think his name is Sammy, the, uh, the guy who designs the Dale of Merchant series. He had, a, I think, a Kickstarter question, um, or it was a, maybe a localization question. Um, and it was great to hear from him. I, I don't think I'd ever heard from Sammy before. I've never gotten to play a Dale of Merchants game, but I followed his work. I, I read a lot of reviews about it, especially with uh, me flirting with the idea of a deck building game. I've heard great things about his game. So I haven't gotten to play them yet, Zach, um, but it, I have recently heard from Sammy, and it was neat to hear from a fellow designer. Um, let me take a break on the questions for a moment, and I'll jump over to what, what topic have I already alluded to? Oh, games that I played recently. Um, Megan and I are currently trying to win at Orleans Invasion, uh, the cooperative expansion to Orleans. We borrowed it from, from some friends. We did kind of a game exchange with some friends recently, some, uh, another couple that, that is looking for two-player games to play because they've exhausted many of their two-player games. And so we're trying. We tried back-to-back -back games this weekend to beat Orleans Invasion and did not. We failed somewhat miserably both times. Um, so we're trying to figure out a way to beat that. We'll probably try again this weekend. We also played Sagrada, a game that ended in a tie, but, uh, but Megan had the, the, the tiebreaker um, due to a reason that I can't remember now at this point. Did it end up with a tie? Am I thinking of a different game? I think I'm thinking of a different game. I think she kicked my butt at Sagrada. Yeah, that's what happened. That's what typically happens with Sagrada. Um, and then well, there was another game that we had with a tie. It was a, a weird instance where I, I think I, what was it? We played a game this weekend where I, I made a move that wasn't fair um, in the game. I can't remember what it is at this point. But Megan's playing through Myst. She's playing through the Myst series of digital games, of video games, the old Myst series. She's on Myst 4 right now. Um, so if you have any suggestions for Myst, -like, after she finishes this series, if you have any suggestions for Myst-like games that, um, that she might enjoy, uh, let me know. She's very good at these, at these digital puzzle games. Looks like Mackenzie has joined us from the Meeple Street. Thanks for joining us today, Mackenzie. Um, and Chris, uh, oh, let's see, Chris is here. Lots of, lots of uh, great media creators here today. Chris is here, um, and he says he can't wait for the Pie and Sky and Tapestry to come in the mail this week. They are on the way indeed. Uh, Chris says, what are Biddy and Walter up to today? Biddy, I don't know if you saw my Instagram uh, yesterday, but both of them have been nesting a lot recently, which I don't know why, because it's not, it's, it's very warm in St. Louis right now. It's a little rainy, it's rainy today, but they've been, Biddy has like a big pile of packing materials that he's created a nest in, and Walter was in the laundry machine the other day. Um, yeah, they're just, they're, they're having a grand old time with these little nests they're making. John says, any update on Wingspan Switch? Any chance that Scythe ever gets ported over there? Um, so I can kind of, I can do my best to answer these questions, John. When I, when we license games to digital developers, it's, it's basically a full handoff to them. They come back to us every now and then to say, hey, are we doing an okay job? And I go back to them every now and then to say, hey, are you working on this? Are you moving forward? But other than that, I don't know a lot. Um, so I don't know exactly where Wingspan on Switch is, the progress of that. I think, from what I understand, Monster Couch is going to attempt to launch Wingspan on a ton of different platforms all at once. And so I think the game might actually be somewhat ready for some of those platforms and not for others. And so that's what's uh, slowing it down a little bit. As for Scythe on Switch, I don't know. I think I, they're still trying to get it on iOS. So I think that's the first step, iOS and Android. Uh, just looking for other questions here as I go down. Uh, Zach says, with my most recent Sunday sit-down, uh, thank you for the, the cue there, Zach. Yeah, I, I like to mention the recent videos that I did. My most recent Sunday sit-down was on, what was it on? Oh, the Board Game Geek Top 10. Yeah, I talked about the Board Game Geek Top, top 10, my thoughts on the Top 10 games in the Board Game Geek um, Top 10, the rankings. That was a fun list to go through. Uh, it, was, it was a weird list to go through because I realized that I have owned six out of the Top 10 games on Board Game Geek. Um, and I don't even own all my favorite games. I've owned six of them, but I actually don't currently own any of them. Um, so they ended up, most of them being games that I really um, admire, enjoyed, that I learned from. But I didn't end up, my rule is if I don't play a game for a year, um, I give it to someone who I think will play it, who wants to play it. So that was an odd kind of realization after the fact of that video, um, how many games that I own but don't actually currently own, that I did own but didn't, don't currently own. Uh, Zach says, why do I think these games tend to be on the longer side? Any thoughts on doing maybe a video of your, your top 10 and the top 100 ranked games? Yeah, I like that idea, Zach, for uh, my top 10 among the BGG top 100. I'll make a note of that. Um, why do I think these games tend to be on the longer side? I, you know, that's a good question. I, well, I think 
probably the, the, the types of people who use Board Game Geek, and this is a vast generalization, but I would say, I would probably guess that a significant number of the people who use Board Game Geek on a regular basis and choose to rent games there are deep into the hobby, um, deep into the Board Game hobby, and probably more inclined to play longer games. I don't think that's necessarily always true because I know people who um, who are very much deep into the hobby and who are the types of people who are always inviting people into the hobby and they use a lot of shorter games to do so. Um, and I'm sure they rank those games on Board Game Geek. So I don't know that that is a vast generalization, but I, I wonder if that's part of it, that um, that deep hobby gamers, people who are deep into the hobby, are more likely to play longer games, more likely to enjoy longer games um, than a more casual gamer who might be less likely to actually participate on Board Game Geek. That's random theory. I'm, I'm op totally open to your theory or other theories in the comments below. So a, a, one way I'm saying that is I don't necessarily think that these, these games on the Board Game Geek Top 10 are, I don't think necessarily think that longer games are better than shorter games, I think is what I'm saying there. Uh, it's all about who's deciding to rank them and rate them. Adrian says, I saw your quote on the Kemet Kickstarter. Would you expand on why you like Kemet so much? So Adrian, there is a video, an older video that I made about Kemet that you can check out on my YouTube channel. You can probably get some details about it. But um, Kemet, yeah, Kemet has had a huge impact on me as a designer. It's one of the few games with direct combat that I really like. And one of the reasons that I really like it is that there isn't a huge sense of loss when you lose combat. And because of that, I actually feel more likely to attack my friends in Kemet. Um, I am somewhat unlikely to do that in other games. I don't like direct, I don't like to pick on a certain player, pick, uh, a, I, don't, I don't like to target a certain player basically. Um, but in Kemet, I don't feel bad doing so because uh, when, you, when you lose combat, you, you don't actually lose that much. It's very easy to get back on the board. Everything is very close on the map. Um, and, uh, and it is possible to go into a battle and like win the battle, but also suffer big losses yourself. And so you kind of, I, I, I don't feel bad basically in, in combat in, in, in Kemet. I also really like the Euro elements to it. There's a lot of upgrade elements to Kemet. Every game feels different because of the tiles that you're selecting, the upgrade tiles. Um, that, that makes every game feel different. I also love the giant monsters, and I love that they can change every game. I love kind of building up to those giant monsters and grabbing them. Um, I don't know. I, I, I love the, the combat, the entire combat system I really, really enjoy, which is something I don't say about a lot of games because I, I don't play a lot of games with combat. Um, but I think it helps that it has these strong Euro elements that make you feel more powerful. There's a sense of progression um, with all this fantastic interaction on the board. And I'm glad you mentioned it. I backed Kemet right away on Kickstarter. I no longer have my copy because um, I think it was honestly, it was one of those games that didn't hit the table as much as I thought it would. Like it, it, we played it a lot for a while and then we moved on to some other games because we really play combat oriented games. But I love what they did with the 1.5 version that's on Kickstarter now, and I am super excited to get it um, next year. So I'm a backer of that. I also backed yesterday the Tantrum House campaign. Tantrum House is a, is a media channel, another uh, board game media channel that I really love. They do previews for our games, um, for many of our games, and I, I just I love their content. I love their preview content, their review content, and they just seem like nice people. And so I, I definitely backed that campaign on day one as well. That's Tantrum House. Nick says he's been playing a lot of Scythe Digital since the quarantine began. Are there any plans to add more of the expansion content into the game? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I've kind of, I, I sent a little email to nudge um, Asmodee Digital and the Knights of, of Unity the, the other day to, to add some of this other stuff to the game, particularly some of the easier expansions. Um, so I, I really hope they do that. Derek is going to play Viticulture this afternoon. That's awesome. Um, Sarah has a nice comment about customer service that's not about me, so I will read this. Um, Joe, and Joe does most of our customer service now. He's our director of communications, and she says that Joe was amazing to help out. She says that my little side of the game pieces were extremely uh, hidden in some bubble, bubble wrap, and I thought they were missing. When I requested the game pieces, he responded very quickly where they might be. That's great. Yeah, I love to hear this, this type of thing where, um, where everything is correct, and maybe it's, uh, we can actually help you find it or solve the problem. That's great. I'm glad Joe was able to help you out. Thanks, Sarah. Mo says, how is Wingspan Oceania going? Uh, it's going really well. We're, um, we're getting close to entering production for it. We're getting there. We're working on the typesetting process right now. Steven says, what do, you th what do I think the right win rate for a co-op game or solo game? Um, I can speak to co-op games, I guess. Uh, I don't really play solo games. The right win rate for a co-op game. 
I think it depends on the type of game. Um, and I've heard co-op game designers say very different things about it. Um, some think that you should never win the first game. Others think that you should have like a 50-50 chance. So I guess you're asking for my opinion. Um, I, don't know, I think it depends a little bit on the type of game. If it's, if it's a scenario-driven narrative game, I don't want to have to replay it. And so I want a 100% win, win rate with maybe varying degrees of, of winning or losing. For a game like Hanabi, um, or Hanabi uh, I guess that also has varying degrees of winning, so that isn't a good example. What is another one? Uh, Burger Brothers. Burger Brothers is a good one. One of my favorite cooperative games. I would say maybe a 33% win rate. I want it to be hard, um, so I want it to feel earned when we actually win it, uh, but, uh, but I want to win sometimes. So, yeah, I'll say around, I'll say around a 33% win rate. Uh, Jonathan says, I don't know if you talked about it last week, but what, do I, what did I think about the 40th Survivor season? Did I talk about that last week? I think I did. Um, it doesn't matter uh, at this point. I'm trying to think how, when the finale actually happened, but it wasn't last week, it was the week before. So I think it's safe to talk about it at this point. Um, I really enjoyed it, I, I, I mean, but I'm extremely biased. I am a huge fan of Survivor. I'm a huge fan of the people who were on the season of Survivor. I thought they played in really unique ways, and I really like how it all turned out. Um, I was trying to come, with the, come to the terms that someone from Exile could actually win it and, and to justify that, and I think the final tribal did some good uh, it justified that pretty well in terms of how, uh, how I'm blanking her name, Natalie, how Natalie was still able to participate in the game from afar, even though she wasn't on the main island. I thought that was a good justification, but ultimately, I am very happy with the person who actually won. I won't say it out loud in case someone is catching up, but I am very happy with the person who actually won Survivor. Dave mentions Abduction as a fantastic Mist style game. Yeah, I think that's actually from the same studio that did Mist, and that was one that I... I coincidentally mentioned to, to Megan the other day. I haven't played it, but I, I love the visuals of it. Dave, did you play it in VR or did you play it on the computer? And would you recommend one over the other? We do have an Oculus. Um, David signed up as a Stillmeyer ambassador. That's awesome, David. Thank you for doing that. I see some other fellow ambassadors among you on the, on the chat here today. I, I did mention Stillmeyer Games News. So some of you have asked about Wingspan Oceana and some of our other games. Um, I'm going to say in some fairly vague terms that I am excited to try a, a prototype for the first time today that, uh, that I designed, um, a game that I've been working on. So I'm going to get that to the table with, by myself, which I don't normally do. I don't normally do the first playtest by myself, but given the circumstances, I think I need to, and I'm excited about it. Um, I also did a playtest the other day of a game submission, um, kind of a, a 30 minute, 30 to 45 minute review of a game that was submitted to us. Um, we're not entirely open for submissions at this point, but this is a, it was a fairly well-known designer, and so I thought, okay, I'll give them a try. Not to say that I, we don't uh, consider games from unknown designers as well. Elizabeth, in fact, all of our designers are, are unknown and, um, when, they, when they submit games to us for the most part. Um, but I, so I did have an interesting playtest of, of a game the other day, and I've also been working on um, some blind playtesting for uh, re reviewing blind playtesting play, play data and making revisions to um, a game that I will announce next year um, that is, that is uh, nearing completion at this point in terms of the design, as well as, uh, what was the other one? Oh, a, an expansion that we're working on. Yeah, so some, I, I know that's very vague. I need to be vague at this point, but, uh, but we are moving forward with an, a number of different products that will be released. Uh, those are all 2020 products, or 2021, 2021 products. At this point, we have completed the, completed the design for anything that will be released in 2020. Jeremy says he does character voiceover and he's considering adding that in a simple app with a game I'm designing. Am I familiar with any games that have utilized voiceover? Most recently, Jeremy, there are a few. Um, there's one coming out next year that I'm really excited about that I'm going to blank on the name of. Um, I think it's from the company that does Chronicles of Cry. No, no, it's a different company. There is one that I'm very aware of. Uh, actually, McKenzie. McKenzie knows about this because McKenzie, you have reviewed at least one of these games that use great voiceovers. So maybe McKenzie can answer in the comments. Um, and uh, actually, I see Will from Tantrum House here. That's awesome. He chimed in. I just mentioned Tantrum House a few minutes ago. Um, but the other game, Jeremy, that I recently played is, uh, is Forgotten Waters. Forgotten Waters uses voiceover um, to a great effect. 
Uh, Reginaldo also asks about news on the Tapestry expansion. No news yet. Uh, the next announcement that we'll have is actually for a new game, not Tapestry. And then after that, I'll start talking about the Tapestry expansion. But I appreciate your enthusiasm for it. I'm, I, I'm eager to get it out there to the world. Will says that he's getting ready. This is Will from Tantrum House. He's getting ready to do a 12-hour game-a-thon this Friday. What's the longest gaming session that I've ever had? Ooh, probably around that amount. Um, no, actually, no, maybe not all that long. Maybe eight hours, uh, either at a convention or at a game day. Yeah, I think the earliest, like, I have a friend who, who hosts game night, game days that often start around 11 and go through dinner. And so that's eight or nine hours. That's, that's probably the longest. But I've also, at Geekway to the West here in St. Louis, that's the gaming convention here, I've done some where I've probably shown up around 10 and left around eight or nine. So maybe 10 hours at most. Yeah. Uh, Martin says, not that it's a huge deal, but to help my, lo but to help my local 115 members gaming group uh, called the Spire Tabletop Gaming during lockdown, he started a best designer tournament to get our members discussing and engaged, which I think is awesome, Martin, that you found a way to connect with people in this time of self-isolation. I love hearing that. Um, and, I, oh, apparently I, I, I won this tournament as best designer. Wow, that's awesome. Well, thank you so much to the Spire Tabletop Gaming Group. That's really cool. Ingrid says, hello from Barcelona. Oh, and my friend Mira just joined as well. Thanks, Mira, for dropping in. Uh, Ingrid also asked for news of the Wingspan Oceana expansion, which we are, uh, we will soon be entering production on it. We're in the typesetting stage right now of that. She says, are you thinking of using egg colors for future expansions as special abilities, for example? Uh, so we do intend to continue to include a new color of egg in each expansion, but the colors will never mean anything. And the reason for that is because people who suffer with, uh, suffer from uh, color blindness issues are never going to be able to see the difference between these eggs. And so we kind of went into it from the very beginning, knowing um, that, uh, that that wouldn't be uh, uh, an option. That is to say, if you want to have a special house rule where the colors of the eggs mean something, you're totally welcome to do so. But on, on a widespread scale, I really don't think it would be, f be fair to people who have color blindness issues. Uh, George mentions uh, another article. So the, the articles that I've written recently were one on Monday that just listed some, some links to a couple different podcasts and articles. George mentions one that was about taxes that I thought would be helpful for people. On Friday, or Thursday, last Thursday, I had one that uh, kind of went viral about Kickstarter pricing and prices on Kickstarter and how I, I, I theorize that I think some Kickstarter creators in the board game space are using MSRP as a starting point to determine their Kickstarter pricing rather than going from the ground up and starting at the price, at the cost for making and shipping the game and then working up from there to a price that might be a lot more appealing to backers. Uh, I think there's a lot of... Um, factors that go into determining Kickstarter prices, but uh, I've been a little concerned about some of the very high prices on Kickstarter right now that look really similar to MSRPs, or at least that they're, the creators are basing the starting prices on MSRPs instead of working from the ground up on a backer-focused, backer-forward backer price that still makes sense and is still profitable for the creator. So I had a blog entry about that that you can check out from last Thursday. I think it was called, what was it called? Um, What's up with current reward prices on Kickstarter was the title of it. Stan says, how do I like the Wheel of Time series? He says he's read the first three books so far. Um, Stan, yeah, I'm, I'm reading it right now for the first time. I am 65% of the way through book two, uh, and I'm really enjoying it. Uh, it I am seeing uh, the criticisms of the series, which is that sometimes it takes a while for it to move forward. But I am still okay with it because I'm really enjoying the learning about the world, learning about the characters and all that. It might drag at some points, but then I'll just speed read through those parts and get to get to the parts where stuff actually happens. But um, so far, I'm really enjoying it. I can I, it is feeling like an epic series so far, which is what I wanted from it. David says, "What are my favorite multiplayer games that are best at two players, and what are my favorite games that scale well?" Well, that's a big question, David. I might need to save that for a Sunday sit down. Favorite multiplayer games that are best at two players. Um, well, I, I'll just off the cuff, I can answer that. Um, Megan and I really enjoy Parks at two players. I actually didn't enjoy it as much at four or five players, but at two, I really enjoyed it. There was one other game that fell into that category of a game that I that I don't enjoy as much at higher player counts, but I really enjoyed it too. I, I don't see it on my two-player shelf right now, so but I'm not quite sure what that was. Uh, so I'll have to think about that one. As for my favorite games that scale well, uh, 
Actually, on the reverse, reverse side, Downforce and Isle of Sky, I don't enjoy them much at lower player counts, but I think they scale extremely well up to higher player counts. Um, and it really, any drafting game, I think, scales really well. And any game that has simultaneous actions, like Fantastic Factories, that's actually one that we really enjoy it too, but we also enjoy it at higher player counts because players are taking their actions simultaneously. David says, another David says he loves my games. Any expansion to Tapestry? Yes, yeah, we are working on an expansion to Tapestry that will be ready later this year. Um, it's in production now. Sarah says, have I played through Aeon and, Aeon's End Legacy? Yes, yeah, about maybe a year and a half ago, I think is when we played through it. She says that her family just finished it and it was awesome. And her favorite mechanisms, I love, she, she's listening to her favorite mechanisms here. She says, uh, Sarah says, the power cards, she loves knowing that you have time to prepare for something or the option to discard it and not shuffling. Yeah, that is really interesting. It, and that is, uh, when I've done research about deck building games, it's one of the major gripes that people have, that they are annoyed by the shuffling. And so that's why I personally lean towards a solution like Aeon's and Legacy, where you don't have to shuffle, or a, uh, or a bag building uh, game where you're using, it's, it's very easy to shuffle tokens in a bag opposed to, to uh, cards. Yeah, but I, I really enjoyed Aeon's End Legacy. I had one small gripe about the end of it that I think you can see in my video. I don't want to spoil it here, but for the most part, I love the tension of the game. I, I love uh, feeling more powerful as we played. I love how the, the turn order shifts throughout the game and how that has a pretty big impact on how each uh, session plays out. And we had some great moments of strategy where we were, uh, that we used the knowledge we had to do what we needed to do at any given time. Um, but, uh, but there was that element of randomness from which, which card is going to come up next, whose turn is it going to be next, that, that can make a big difference. We also really love that there are, uh, and this isn't really, this isn't, isn't, is not a spoiler for Aeon's End Legacy, but there are individual cards that are villains that you can defeat or interact with uh, and completely remove them from the game if you defeat them or not, and they get stronger and stay in the game and show up in future sessions. I thought that was really, really cool that the decisions you make right now can have an impact on future games based on an individual card level in the game. I thought that was really, really cool. Stephen says that Rodney Smith from Watch It Played, I'm going to get a little water here while I read this, Stephen. Um, Rodney Smith teamed up with Chaz from Board Game Geek and Paula from Things Get Dicey. Uh, Rod, I recently teamed up. Oh, he's talking about some team ups. Uh, teamed up with Ryan from Nights Around the Table. Dice Tower is always adding people. Is this a new trend? Um, mega channels and board gaming are just a coincidence. Honestly, I think Dice Tower is well ahead of, uh, of, of the rest of the industry with this. I think they were really smart from very early on. I think Man vs. Meeple has done this too, but Dice Tower really started it where I think Tom at some point, I'm guessing, realized, hey, I can, I can have essentially a TV network of people. It doesn't need to be all me. I can, I can have people from around the world contributing to my network. Um, I think that was a brilliant idea, and I, I'm, it's neat to see that other people are, are, are doing so or teaming up in that way. Mackenzie says, how do I feel, or how did I feel about Machi Kuro Legacy? I assume you're talking about Legacy, because that's what we recently played, at two players. Would I suggest waiting to play at a higher player count if possible, or was two players engaging enough to merit playing through? I would say two players was fantastic. And maybe even, I, I can't compare it to three or four, but it flowed so well at, at two that I have to recommend it at two. I think it, we had a great time with it at two. And the nice little perk about it at two is that we played through it at two and then we reset it because the legacy components are resettable in this game. So they're not actually truly permanent. Um, and so we gave that to our other couple friend the other day so they can play through it as well. So uh, you can play through it with your husband and then pass it on to somebody else, uh, another couple, so they can play through it. Thank you, Cody, for contributing these links today. Cody uh, has a, a link to Kemet here. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Miles says, it looks like the NBA is considering a World Cup-like structure for the playoffs with a group stage. Ooh, that's really cool. I heard the NHL is doing something like that. I didn't know about the NBA considering that as well. I'd love it. I, I'd love a unique finish to the NBA season. I'd love a unique finish to the English Premier League this, this year. Um, I might even tune into sports that I usually don't care about, like, the, like hockey, uh, just to see them do something different. I think this is an opportunity to experiment um, and do something cool at all these sports. I know there's a lot of money involved, but I hope they, they end up doing something really, really neat. 
Mackenzie says, uh, how do I feel about Machu Picchu? Oh, Ma Mackenzie's repeating her question. Okay, thanks, Mackenzie. I didn't miss it that time. Um, but I do miss, if I do miss your question, feel free to repeat it. I, it's, I'm not intentionally missing it. I'm just a little back in time right now. Robert says, uh, did I hear you say that your next game is a Zelda-inspired open world game? Robert, I said that I am uh, working on a cooperative exploration open world game that is inspired, at least partially, by Breath of the Wild. Um, yeah, I am working on it. It is not my, well, I will not say whether or not it's my next game, but I, I'm saying that I'm currently working on it. Julia says, uh, should the win rate be higher if it's a campaign-based co-op? That's a good question, Julius. If it's a campaign-based co-op, should, should the win rate of a cooperative game be higher? Um, hmm. I don't know. That's a good question. I think, so I, I did a whole video recently about failing forward in campaign games versus having to replay them. And I think it depends on the type of game, but in general, I prefer to fail forward. If you lose a, a game, you move forward. And so the win rate still matters, I guess, in that instance. But what matters a lot more are the consequences themselves. I don't necessarily know if it should be higher, but I'm certainly open to, uh, to, to opinions there about it. Uh, let's see. Uh, David answered my question about Abduction, uh, which is a, a follow-up to Mist by the creators of Mist. He says he played it on PC, but he can't speak to the quality of the VR experience, but he definitely loved it on PC. Cool. That's good. Yeah, I'm guessing Megan would probably play, play that on the PC, but the, the VR option is kind of neat to have. Um, I see other questions, but let me jump over real quick to see if I have any other topics. As I mentioned, I'm backing Kemet and Tantrum House on Kickstarter right now. Uh, we recently fi f finished uh, Six Feet Under. I asked for TV show recommendations a few weeks ago, maybe even a month ago. And so we watched Six Feet Under based on your recommendation and the recommendation of people on my personal blog. And we really enjoyed it. Uh, it was a solid show. Um, and uh, the ending was really good. I, 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 I think a lot of people raved about the final episode. And I thought it was solid. I thought it was a little sudden in terms of certain things that happened that were distinctly different than, than what had happened in a few previous episodes. But still really good. We are now trying out, as our nighttime hour-long show, we're trying out Succession on HBO, which is about a, a very rich family business um, full of people that are so far very unlikable. But I'm curious to see if that turns around and if we get wrapped up in this, into this family and this business show. We're watching Kim's Convenience at lunch. I know this is not board game related at all, but just mentioning what we're, the types of media that we're consuming right now. Um, yeah, I think that's it for my topics. I didn't have a lot to cover on in terms of topics this week. Uh, Mackenzie answered my question about voiceover work. So she said that the Isofarian Guard and Frosthaven both will be using uh, the Foreteller. Foreteller, yeah, that was it. Thank you for writing that, Mackenzie, to add voiceover. And they've done a phenomenal job with it. So I think that's great. I think it's cool that a company now is specializing in voiceover work. That's really neat. Steven says, if I tried Smartphone Inc., the game Smartphone Inc., and I haven't tried that yet, Steven. He says, do I have any interest in designing games with modern themes? Yeah, I'm not opposed to it. Um, I guess modern is, is very different than postmodern. So like current, like a current modern theme, possibly. Uh, I do love the idea of escapism in games, escaping to another world, another time, an alternate reality. I like that idea of escaping from current reality into a different uh, place or, or time. So I think it is unlikely that we would publish a, uh, or that I would consider designing a modern game, a, a current game, but it is not out of the realm of possibility because I think there are still uh, wonderful, amazing things that happen in the real world every day that, uh, that, that, can be, that can provide some sort of escapism. Uh, Mackenzie says she would love to see Forteller do something like the Rise of Fenris to provide an even more engaging experience. That would be cool, actually, a Forteller version of Rise of Fenris. I'm going to have to think about that. Uh, just scrolling down, looking for questions right now. Uh, Benjamin says, just want to know if we are going to have some news this summer for the board game Codename Sand. I won't talk about specifically that code name, Benjamin, but I will say that um, we have an e-newsletter coming up next Wednesday. There will not be any big announcement in that e-newsletter. I think I'll talk about probably the Scythe Complete Rulebook, which will be news to some people, but not, uh, but not brand new breaking news. And then in early July, our early July e-newsletter, um, I, will, I will talk about a new game. So you'll get some news about the one new game released by Stomar Games in 2020. We, we still stay very small and focused every year, 
sometimes we do two games a year. Last year we did Wingspan and Tapestry. This year we're just doing one game. Sarah says, I uh, just wanted to share that our 10-year-old son, uh, Sarah's 10-year-old son, told us that when he grows up, he wants to design games and be like Jamie Stegmeyer. Oh, well, that, that's, thank you, Sarah, for, sa for sharing that. And thank you to, for your 10-year-old son for, for saying something like that. Uh, she says he is interested in both tabletop and video games, but you are definitely a big influence on his little life. Oh, that, that makes my week right there to hear. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and I think it's great that he's into both tabletop and video games because I think there's a lot that tabletop game designers can learn from video games and a lot that video gamers, game designers can learn from, from tabletop games. I don't play a lot of video games, but I watch a lot. I, and I consume a lot of content about video games so that I can be in, better informed from them as a game designer. Michael says, just finished Dune. Have you read that? This is one that I'll need to give a try after The Wheel of Time. I have tried to read Dune. I got about 50, maybe even 100 pages into it, and I just couldn't get into it. It, it felt, it's going to sound terrible, but it felt a little antiquated, whereas The Wheel of Time feels like it could have been written yesterday uh, based on the, the writing style uh, of it. Um, but I need to give Dune another try. Uh, I know a lot of people love it and recommend it. James says, what do I think about Simon's use of Kickstarter? They seem like a big enough company at this point that they don't really need it. Um, he says, Ankh most definitely fell into the category of pricing at MSRP. I did think their pricing was a little weird for Ankh. I'll agree with that. Uh, however, uh, I, I would not necessarily agree with the assertion, James. I know this is very contentious, but that there is such thing as a company being big enough or small enough to use Kickstarter. I think any creator is welcome to use Kickstarter if they want to create something new for people. Uh, Kickstarter, I think, is great at gauging demand for a product. I think any company can use it to gauge demand, to make a product better through feedback and through stretch goals, to, um, to, to determine, to, to raise funding, uh, to, to determine like where to ship all the copies of the game for fulfillment around the world. That's something that I still have to struggle with. I have to, it's a guessing game for me because I don't use Kickstarter anymore. anymore. Um, and it's a great way to engage the community. That said, there are many other ways to do all those things. I think Kickstarter consolidates them into one nice tight package, um, but you've seen from Stomar Games, there is another way to do it, and that's how we do it, but I'm not gonna judge other companies for doing that or other creators, um, as long as they are looking out for their backers. And if they're not looking out for their backers, if they're not putting their backers first, uh, the backers are gonna stop returning to their campaign. So that's capitalism at work there, in a good way. Denholm says, how has the Charterstone digital app turned out? He has. He hasn't had. He says he, he hasn't had a chance to check it out. But the board game really pushed the leg, the legacy innovation. Thank you, Denholm, for 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 saying that. Yeah, I was trying to do something different with the legacy genre. Um, I think it was the person was the first true legacy game that. Um, actually, no, that isn't true. There was one other one, but I was going to say the first true legacy game that uh, that wasn't based on an existing game. But I think there was one other one. It was uh, like a Rapid Fire, some uh, some deck building game that Rado loves that I haven't played. But how has it turned out? I've heard great things about it. I, I haven't played through the digital game myself because I'm actually still in the middle of a, can a, a real tabletop Charterstone campaign. Um, but I've heard great things about it, and it, it has apparently sold very well. Alex has a nice compliment here. He says, oh, he says he would love a new Wingspan expansion from based on South America. And yeah, that's one that we definitely hope to do someday. We hope to do every continent for Wingspan expansions. David says, do I love uh, building dice game survival? I got my prototype. What would I love to see? Do I love building dice game survival? So I love dice. I do love dice games. I did a, a top 10 video recently about my favorite dice games, what I love about dice games. Um, do I love the idea of building dice, like Dice Forge? I do really think, I think that's really cool for, for Dice Forge. Um, and survival. Survival is maybe a little hit or miss for me. Um, if, if a game is too punishing, uh, it can be difficult. But I do love games with puzzly aspects to them. So if there's a puzzly aspect to survival, I, I, I can enjoy that. Yeah. I'm trying to think of an example of a game that you could use for this survival. So like um, uh, Seventh Continent does survival in a pretty interesting way where you, uh, and actually Subnautica, the video game Subnautica does survival in a really cool way too. I would say actually almost the coolest way because in Subnautica, they use survival as a way to kind of teach you how to play the game. And then you get to a point in the game where you, uh, survival is not really something that you really even think about. Your whole focus is on exploration, but the game has used survival to teach you the core elements of the game. 
So I think that's really cool to kind of compel you to do certain things so that you definitely learn them. It uses survival. So I think that's an interesting way to, to approach a game where uh, survival is almost the, uh, I'm forgetting the term, or the tutorial. Survival is the tutorial to get you to understand the core mechanisms, but it's not the heart of the game. But there are some good survival games out there too. Demetrius says, have I checked YouTube channels where advanced tactics of scythe are being discussed? Um, I actually, I love that. I, I have watched a few of them. Uh, the Mill, the Mill does some great uh, posts about that, some great videos about it. Um, I have watched some of them. I haven't watched all of them about side strategy, but I love that idea. I wish there were more channels that do a deep dive into uh, strategy, game strategy. In fact, I would love to watch one right now about Orleone's invasion strategy because I want to get better at Orleone's invasion so we can actually win it. Um, and while part of the puzzle is us figuring that out on our own, I think I would also have a lot of fun watching a video for, some, for having someone talk about strategy as well. So I think it's great that there are channels doing that for Scythe. Bree says, do I know about uh, Gels Marble Runs? It's now being sponsored by Last Week Tonight, which is actually how I know about it, Bree. Yeah, we, uh, Last Week Tonight, not this past week, they didn't have an episode, but last week John Oliver had an episode about it, and he did talk about it. That's how I found out about it. I'm sorry, I'm eager to, to watch it when, it when it goes live. George says, am I watching Netflix in general? There's a new history called, a new documentary called History 101. It's really good. Oh, thank you for the recommendation. Yeah, I'm always looking for a new, good new series on Netflix. Um, someone the other day also recommended Unorthodox as a series. And what was the other one? Oh, uh, The Bodyguard or Bodyguard on Netflix. So we need to try those out as well. And Outer Banks. I want to try out Outer Banks because... Uh, the Outer Banks in North Carolina, it's a beach area of North Carolina where my family has gone for vacation for many, many years. I doubt the show has anything to do with that, but I kind of like the connection there. So I want to I give that a try to see if it's any good. Julia says, have I watched Avatar The Last Airbender? Yes, I have. Yeah, some friends recommended it a few years ago and I went through the series and watched it. The first, I've watched like Avatar The Last Airbender, the animated series. I have not watched Korra. Is that what came next? I haven't watched that. Robert says, uh, do I have a game length that you like to target or is it just a general feeling about game flow and an ending to the game that feels right? It's a little combination of all of that. I, I definitely usually have a target. Um, we, we try to publish event games, so like the, the heart of a game night, the meat of a game night. But that can really range from 45 to 60 minutes up to 90 plus, like slightly over 90. For me, I think 90 is kind of the sweet spot. Um, maybe even a little shorter, depends on the game. But usually when I'm designing a game, I am trying to keep that in mind, trying to, to uh, uh, even, I will even adjust uh, how the game, how long the game is in terms of like rounds, for example, if the game has rounds. I did, the, I did this in Tapestry. I think the original version of Tapestry, one of the prototypes had one additional round and the game kind of outstayed its welcome at that point. And so I cut off a round and that uh, made the game feel better because it did not say it was welcome and it got it down to a closer to the playing time which I wanted, which was around 90 minutes. Miles says, how far am I into succession? Just one episode right now. He says it takes two to three episodes to get into, but we really love it. Uh, he says, we love to watch the characters even if we don't find many, most of them very likable. That's good to know. Yeah, I, I, I heard actually just from another friend today that I need to watch like a few, up to, she said she got five episodes into it before she really started to enjoy it. And I am will, willing to give it that chance because um, it, it, it seems pretty interesting and well filmed. Fabian says, hello from Paris. How do I think legacy games are play tested from beginning to end? How can blind play testers test these types of games? Do I send the materials to each group and one copy for each session? Yeah, Fabian, it, this is one of the hardest things about play testing a legacy game. Um, I, I think you could probably do it digitally at this point using Tabletop Simulator or Tabletopia, but when we were blind play testing Charterstone, uh, I actually paid someone to make the prototypes because the prototypes were extremely elaborate um, to, to create. And we didn't want the play testers to print them off at home because they would have to spoil so much by printing it at home. Um, if I did it again, I might be a little bit more open to that. I, I less focused on the spoiler aspect of it and um, more focused on just getting it out there, but it just, it, it took a lot of effort to put together each of these prototypes. So I did, I, I basically paid someone to put together a full prototype, um, multiple of them, and then we would send them to different playtest groups and they would use those prototypes to playtest the game. As for stickers, like writing on the cards is easy. That, that part is easy. Um, the stickers 
we, we didn't have stickers to play test with, but we kind of, I think we used, um, I think we just had people write on the cards instead. Uh, how did we do that? Oh, no, we had them tape them. We had, uh, yeah, this is, this is how we did it. So in Charterstone, there are um, hexagonal buildings that in the final game, you peel off the card because the re remainder of the card still means something. You peel it off the card, you put it on the board when you build a building. For the prototype, we had playtesters actually cut it off the card, cut it out off the card and tape it to the board and then keep that card remnant for the other purpose that it served. Not a perfect solution, but it got the job done. Remy says, I've had so much fun reading and voice acting the Clank Legacy campaign for my family that I wouldn't want to give it away to an app. I can totally see that, that it is fun to read it out loud. Um, they say, what's the best legacy game that I've played? What is my current one right now? I would probably say Clank Legacy is my favorite legacy game. I really love legacy games. There are a lot um, that, I would, that I put on a, on a top 10 list. I think I, I do have a video about legacy games, but I think at the time I'd only played like seven of them. So it's not even a top 10 list. But, uh, but yeah, Clank Legacy was probably my favorite legacy experience. And Anne's Legacy, Anne's End Legacy, which was mentioned earlier, is definitely up there as well. Zach says, do I feel like Missouri is the best state to run my business from? Have I ever thought about moving elsewhere? Um, I mean, it was more like I live here and so I have to, I have to register it in Missouri. I have not thought about moving elsewhere, no. Um, there are probably states where the taxes are, are better for running a business. I, I think I've heard that Delaware is really good for that for some reason. Um, but I don't think I would move just to get a tax benefit. Stevens, oh, see, that's a joke about uh, the Charterstone app. As he, as he says, do you have to delete the Charterstone app after you finish it? And you don't, no, you can actually play it again or you can, you can save your, your village and play with that village as much as you want and then start a new game. That's the nice thing about the digital game. Jason says, I've talked before about my interest in IPs like Red Rising, intellectual properties. Uh, curious if I've ever kicked the tires on some public domain IPs aside from the usual sus suspects like Lovecraft, Dracula, Alice in Wonderland. Uh, I, I haven't really. If there's ever one that comes up that I'm really enamored by, I guess I'd consider it. But, uh, but, I, but I haven't done that yet, no. Paul says about Kuminir Nod, Simon, since they make minis games, mostly minis games, uh, they have a high setup cost. Kickstarter is a perfect fit. I can see that. Uh, I can see that that having that raising money up front for for miniatures does help. I don't think it's necessary. I, I think companies can still, like, yeah. I, I think it depends a little bit because any company who has who goes into making a minis game. Uh, They've already invested some money in creating the, the, the models, right? Um, but they probably haven't created the molds. And there is a high cost to doing that. But for a company like CMON, uh, I highly doubt that they've spent all this time on Ankh. And I'm not saying they shouldn't have used Ankh for Kick uh, Ankh on Kickstarter. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just responding to your comment here. Um, for a company like Kulmini Kul or not, that's already invested in those models they're gonna make the game. I don't necessarily think they're using the Kickstarter to raise funds for the molds. It does help, but I don't think it's necessary. Whereas maybe a new creator um, who, who doesn't have funds, and I actually don't even know how many, how much the funds that Kulmini or not has. I'm just looking at like, that some companies are definitely gonna make the game either way, and some companies are not. And I think Kulmini or not is one of the companies that is definitely gonna make the game either way. But anyway, uh, he points out that every stretch goal is another mold paid for. Probably, yeah, they, th that's a way of them tying it in. I think stretch goals are more carried on a stick marketing. Um, yeah, those are my thoughts on, on that, Paul. I, I, I'm not blaming them at all for using Kickstarter. I think it's a completely viable tool for them to use. They use it pretty well still. Um, and, uh, and, and you're probably right that, that some of the money goes into the mold they need to, to make the miniatures. Benjamin says, do I know if Asmodee will add in the near future Scythe, the Wind Gambit, and the Rise of Fenris to the Scythe digital apps? Uh, I, heard, I, I sure hope so. I, I think they're working on the Wind Gambit um, right now, or they might be more focused on iOS. I don't know where they are right now. I should probably get an update about that. I'll send them a little note and see what they're up to. 
James says, do I understand that you would prefer to see more app involvement in tabletop games? Oh no, the, the opposite, James. Or not the opposite, I love that there's innovation with apps. I have nothing against companies that use apps for their games. For me, I prefer to turn off screens when I play games. Um, I don't like having the screen, screens open and, and on. So I, I'm not particularly interested in it. I, I'm happy to play games that use apps in innovative ways, but it's not something that I think about for some of our games. Um, yeah. Rayleigh says, oh, talking about Kuhlman or not, um, Christopher recommends Mandala. Yeah, I've heard great things about Mandala. I need to play that. Some thoughts about Kuhlman or not, if you want to read them in the comments here. Uh, Sarah, th uh, rec uh, thanks me for recommending Red Rising. I would highly recommend the Red Rising book series to anyone um, who wants to give it a try. I, one of my favorite series ever. Rafal says, what, is my f what are my favorite top three space movie series? Space movie series, well, Star Wars, definitely, number one. Um, what other space movie series are there? I mean, there's, there's Star Trek. I have enjoyed some Star Trek movies, but definitely not all of them. It might just be by default, number two. I think Megan's shouting, what, Megan? Firefly. Firefly. Well, that's a, it's a TV series. Firefly is a great TV series. Yeah, for kind of TV series in here, I would include Firefly. I'd include Battlestar Galactica. Um, yeah, probably, the, yeah, those are the big two. I'm sure I'm missing some giant movies or, or TV series in here as well. Travis says, not sure if this is the place or the time, but he's curious about this, uh, the new Scythe rulebook. So the, we have put together with the help, uh, really, I mean, most of the effort came from uh, a husband and wife, a couple, a team, who decided that they wanted to compile, compile all the rules for Scythe into one rulebook. And not just like pasting together the rules, but like to put all the mech rules in one place, all the, the faction rules in one place, um, to add in FAQs uh, for questions that have been asked over and over again about Scythe. Um, and it just make a, like, basically like the internet of Scythe in one complete rule book. And they did that and they did a fantastic job and we decided to print it. And so it is a spiral bound, I believe it's 126 pages that includes all Scythe rules, a robust index, um, and it looks fantastic. We are working on printing it right now. So it is a finished product that we are printing right now and it will be available sometime this summer. I'll talk about it a little bit more in detail, I think, in our next week's e-newsletter, because I don't have much else to talk about then, but uh, it not, it's not a big secret. It, it, is, uh, it is what it is. And we will be making it, we decided to make a, a PDF version of it available in black and white, um, kind of a low-res black and white thing so that people can easily search it and, and, and use the, the digital version if they want, but we do want to encourage people to check out uh, the, the, uh, the printed version, because I think it's really nice. James says, in the Scythe group, people still post spoiler warnings for Rise of Fenris. Are spoilers a, forever, are spoilers a forever thing in tabletop games? I think so. I think it's just uh, being considerate. Yeah, like, like I wouldn't want to spoil uh, Survivor. I wouldn't want to spoil, um, you know, a, a, a movie for someone who's really, who hasn't watched it yet. So as for the duration of it, I, I, think, I think it's still nice to be considerate about it, but, um, but I also don't think at this point for Rise of Fenris, it being almost two years old at this point, that anyone should blast someone for, for uh, posting spoilers. Um, I hope there's kindness and consideration both ways. Rayleigh says, any resources that I can recommend for getting into game design? Uh, yeah, actually, Rayleigh, go to the Stomar Games website and the menu is go to uh, Kickstarter and then at the bottom of the Kickstarter menu, it doesn't really fit into Kickstarter, but it's how to design a tabletop game or search Stonemaier Games, how to design a tabletop game. And I have a compilation of a number of different resources there that can get you started. Organ says, could I please do a Sunday sit down about what I love about the tactile aspects of gaming? Um, walk us through some great games from a tactile standpoint and talk about games in which you designed and that I designed end up having evolving a lot during develop in terms of tactile engagement. I haven't found one yet. There, I do have a video about my favorite components in games, which is very close to what you're saying. You might want to check that out. It's an older video. I think it's like two years old at this point. But search my YouTube channel for um, like top 10 favorite components, and I think you might find it there. Uh, and very close, I think, what, to what you're describing here. I don't think I talked too much about the development of them, uh, 
But, uh, and then honestly, during the development of a game, while I do, I really do like the playtests on the tabletop so I can touch and feel the different components, we don't use final components for playtests. So uh, we rarely experience like the true tactile sensation, like, like down to like the special textures that we use in uh, the tapestry player mats, things like that. We don't experience those things um, while we're actually playtesting. Um, but I can imagine what many of those things feel like. I, I know that I like that texture, so I know that that will go over well. I know that I will enjoy it, things like that. Sarah says, anyone out there have any recommendations on paints for very beginner painters for chibi style minis? Uh, you'll have to look for other people that comment on that in the, in the comments here, Sarah, because I don't know a lot about painting. I don't know anything about, about painting. Nick says, any update on the Red Rising game? So Nick, the, the Red Rising is an IP that I really had hoped to design a game for. I tried, and, um, and uh, as I mentioned before, I, I, I did not figure it out. Uh, so uh, it, it is not a game that exists. Uh, it is a game that I, that I wanted to exist. Adrius, Andreas says, favorite Euro games, uh, most recent one, how much theme is important to them for you? So there is a video about this too. Um, in fact, most of my favorite games are Euro games. I love uh, Tolkien. This year I really loved uh, Glenn Moore Chronicles. That's a, that's a fantastic Euro game. Um, how much, uh, Andreas says, how much theme is important to them for you? You know, the mechanisms are more important to me in a Euro game, but I do like when the theme makes the, uh, informs the mechanisms that makes sense, helps me learn and remember the mechanisms, and, uh, and uh, it is at least considered in, in terms of the, the, the design of the game. Um, I, I will mention it here, but I did play a game recently, a Euro game, that was very much just a classic Euro game with no real theme at all, and that made it difficult for me to learn the game because the, the theme wasn't engaging with the mechanisms at all. So it, I think it is important, um, but in the end, it's the, it's the mechanisms, it's the puzzle, it's the opportunities to feel clever that, uh, that, are, that are more important to me in a Euro game. Travis says, any news on My Little Scythe expansions? Uh, yeah, yeah, we actually, it's, it's, uh, we already re released it. So it's, um, if you ordered it, maybe you're asking uh, that you, you ordered it and you're waiting on your copy, Travis. Um, but uh, it, should, uh, it should have arrived by now. So if you have an order and it hasn't arrived yet, feel free to let our customer service know, let Joe know, and uh, it will work on that for you. But My Little Side, the expansion is out there. Uh, the, re the retail release date is June 19th. But all the pre-orders from Stillmire Games should have arrived by now. Dexter says, tapestry expansion, question mark, question mark, smiley face. Uh, yes, there is a tapestry expansion coming out this year. Lars says, uh, I wonder what my favorite abstract game is. Keep up the good work. Um, there also, also a video, there's a video about this on my YouTube channel, my favorite abstract games. Uh, what did I put at my top? I, Sagrada was definitely up there. Blockus was up there. Um... Let me see if I can pull up the video real quick. But I'll, I'll kind of post a few of these videos below that a few of you have asked for. Um, this will take a second. Okay, I'll go to my channel, my YouTube channel here. I'll look up uh, components because I know that's one. My top 10 favorite components. I'll do that one first. Here's my video to my top 10 favorite components. And then what was the next one? The next one was... Uh, the next question was about, oh, what was the next one? That was tactile aspects, uh, favorite Euro games. I think I had one about Euro games. Let's see if I actually do. I may not have a favorite. No, I don't have a favorite one about Euro games in general. Um, but then uh, abstract. I, de I definitely did one fairly recently on abstract games. So let me pull that up. Favorite, yeah, at favorite abstract strategy games. Just two months ago, I did it. Um, some of the ones I mentioned here are. Oh, yeah, the, the top ten is actually right here on the on the list. Sagrada is up there. Blockus is up there. I won't reveal number one in case you don't want to spoil it for yourself. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll post I'll post a link to that video in the comments here as well, so you can check that out. Walter's whining at me here, down below. Uh, Sigurd says, can I say anything more about the Tapestry expansion? What is my focus vision for it? Um, I just I really wanted to, to 
to add a little bit more variety to it. Um, I think Tapestry itself out of the box offers a lot of variety, but I wanted to offer more stuff, more Tapestry cards that did something a little different. Uh, they do have a, a, a new focus. Um, I wanted to add some more civilizations that, that feel very different, and they do feel very different in this new expansion. Um, and some other stuff that I'm not ready to talk about yet. I, I love the enthusiasm for it, uh, but it's, it's a little bit too early at this point. Everything is set in stone. The design is complete. It's in production now. Um, but we're going to wait probably until August to talk about that in detail. But I love the curiosity about it. And Casey says, Casey says, is there a Tapestry expansion? And yes, there is a Tapestry expansion in production now, and it will be released later this year. Lots of talk about tapestry today. Perhaps tapestry on people's, is on people's minds, which I love. I love that you're, you're playing tapestry right now. All right, that's, that's the, uh, the hour for me. And so I'm going to uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sign off here, and I hope you have a great week. If you have any questions that you think of after watching this, check out the YouTube version of this. I'm going to go post it on YouTube right now. All right, take care. Have a good Wednesday. Stay safe and stay healthy. I'll see you next week.